coming on a toasty September afternoon, uh, leaving the beach to join us for an erudite occasion such as this. Um, this is the uh, Center for Latin American, Caribbean, and Latino Studies kickoff event for, for the 2017-2018 uh, academic year. I wanted, on behalf of the center, I'm Sonia Alvarez, I'm the director. Uh, I wanted to welcome all of you back and um, extend also a special welcome to this year's Fulbright Chair in Brazilian Studies, Cristina Shadow Wolf, uh, who will speak to us about women's resistance to military dictatorship and the new conservative coup in Brazil. But before I introduce our special guest, I wanted to tell you that the center, um, along with other folks on campus, are working uh, on setting up uh, UMass disaster relief efforts for Puerto Rico and other Caribbean islands and also Mexico. Um, and um, we will be working or trying to identify local NGOs that are doing relief work um, in various locations so that the money can go directly to the ground and not to these massive relief agencies and whatnot. Um, we don't have the specs together on where the money how the money will be collected and so on. But you'll be hearing from us shortly. And please make sure, Carolyn, to send, uh, in addition to an attendance list, a list around for people who might want to help with that effort to, um, to um, assist um, folks in these regions that have been quite devastated. Now, on a brighter note, um, I wanted to tell you that we have lots of exciting programming uh, coming up for this fall. Um, after this event, our next event will be on October, our, our next big event uh, will be on October 16th, um, and it will be a discussion of the current situation in Venezuela uh, with Marta Fuentes, who's a professor of communications, Alejandro Velasco from NYU, uh, who's a Venezuela specialist, and Javier Corrales, who's another Venezuela specialist uh, in political science at Amherst College. And then on the week of October 24th, we don't have a precise date yet, we'll have a visit by um, folks from um, an NGO called Desagua, which is a Guatemalan development NGO um, that, will be on a, that has worked with a number of our students. They'll be here towards the end of October. Then on November 26th, we'll have a roundtable discussion um, that will be part, like today's um, lecture, will be part of our Learning from Latin America series that we'll be holding all year that will be called uh, that is called Authoritarianism, Populism, and Democratic Struggles: Lessons from Latin America. I think um, it's time the U.S. looked south instead of looking at its own belly button, as we say in Portuguese. Um, so um, there will be a, a, a roundtable discussion on populism in comparative perspective and in theoretical perspectives. Uh, with our own Troy Alejandro from political science um, uh, here at UMass, Angelica Bernal, also from political science, Luis Maria Sanchez, who's um, also from political science, and then Robert Samet, uh, who is an anthropologist from Union College. Uh, you will be getting plenty of notices about all of this. I'm just giving you a kind of heads up about uh, programming in general. On November 13th, we'll be back in this chapel um, for a, an event called Knowledge Across Borders, uh, UMass-Mexico Scholarly Collaborations, uh, that will feature uh, presentations about the Large Millimeter Telescope, which is the largest in the world and is a product of the UMass-Mexican um, UMass collaboration, a collaboration between astro astronomers at UMass and the Instituto Nacional de Astrofisica, Optica y Electronica. Um, and in addition to that, there'll be a non-science specific interdisciplinary panel with featuring other collaborations between UMass um, faculty and Mexican colleagues. And then on December 4th, we'll return to Brazil um, for a panel that doesn't have a precise title yet, but that will be about protest politics and the conservative backlash, whatever you want to call what's going on in Brazilian government today, uh, featuring, um, again, Cristina, and then three other visiting scholars who I'm going to ask, there's two of them here, to please stand and take a bow so people will know who you are. They're available through the center if you want to talk to them. Uh, one of them is um, Priscila Carvalho from the Federal University of Minas Gerais. Another is Iris Ducarmo from Unicampi in uh, 
state of Sao Paulo, and another is Laura Martelo, also from UF Niger, but she may be joining us later. Anyway, that's December 4th. Hope you, everyone wrote all of those dates down. Um, and then there'll also be, throughout the semester, a Latin American film festival organized by um, graduate students and faculty from the Spanish and Portuguese department, which this year will feature films um, that um, are, are made by women filmmakers. So that should be exciting. So please make sure to sign on to our list if you're not on it, so you can hear about all these events. And others will be co-sponsoring. And now, finally, we'll turn to Christina, and let me just say a few words about her before. I turn the lectern over to her. Um, Christina Scheider-Wolf is full professor of history in, uh, of the history department at the Federal University of Santa Catarina, USCI in Brazil, and is this year's Fulbright Chair in Brazilian Studies at UMass uh, for the fall semester of 2017. Her current research analyzes gender and emotion as components of discourses of resistance to the Southern Cone dictatorships. It strives to comprehend how the subjects in the resistance mobilized feelings, family ties, friendships, and especially gender discourses as agency to oppose dictatorships and constructing political configurations. She takes comparative and cross-sectional perspective to work with Brazil, Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, Paraguay, and Uruguay. She is also working on a project about feminism in Brazil as a social conflict that helped configure the current political scenario. She's one of the editors of Feministas Feministas, which is the premier uh, Brazilian feminist studies journal. Uh, she holds a PhD from the University of São Paulo uh, and published her thesis, Women of the Forest, A History, um, and several other books and chapters and articles. Most recently and very significantly, she was bravely the coordinator of the 13th Women's World Congress and the 11th Fazenda do Gênero Conference, um, that gathered 9,000 participants uh, from around the world at the Federal University of Santa Catarina in Florianópolis, which is, by the way, my other hometown, um, this past August. It was just a remarkable thing. I, don't, I, don't, I can't believe she made it through that and is here with us today. So that alone um, is, uh, deserves a round of applause, but join me in welcoming Christina. And first of all, uh, fora temer, aos temer. <laughs> uh, and I would like to thank uh, um, Sonia Alvarez and the staff of CLAX for, for welcoming me, and also the uh, Brian Ogilvy and the, the Department of History, who is also welcoming me <laughs> very well. And I'm <laughs> I'm very uh, glad to be here uh, with you today. Um, I will read, so it will be. <laughs> I will not be lost in my in my talk. And uh, but if you if something is not clear, please let me know. Uh, I when I was thinking about this this challenge Sonia uh, puts for me because she, she said ah, you have to, to, to make something um, that connects this uh, the, the, your research that my research is about the past and the story and these uh, circumstances we are living in Brazil so I uh, it was a, a it was a challenge <laughs> And I tried to, to write something new. <laughs> so uh, I was thinking about Walter Benjamin and what he says. And in, the, in, the, in my talk, I think it will be clearer. But this is uh, one of his, a piece of one of his theses about history. At the end of uh, 2016 in Brazil, the general sentiment was one of great dismay. Graffiti on walls, Facebook posts, conversations 
They all said one thing, let's hope this cursed year ends soon. All people were thinking about it. After all, it was the year of the coup, the golpe. In addition to major cuts in funding for health and education, as well as an intense sensation of the loss of rights and opportunities, along with economic loss for, count, for the country and its people. Unfortunately, this Benjaminian feeling that the enemy has not ceased to be victorious did not magically disappear with the turn of the year and even became more expressive in 2017. Here, I would like to undertake the task of the historian who is convinced that we have to set alight the sparks of hope in the past and in the present by discussing women's resistance to the dictatorships from 1964 to 1985 and against new conservative coup in Brazil. In recent years, I have been uh, researching women's participation and protagonism in the resistance to the dictatorships that held sway in the southern countries, uh, these countries in blue there, <laughs> in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and their intersection with feminism. This project was focused, has focused on sentiment and affections in the manner in which people became engaged in struggle the discourses, and especially as a means of shaping public opinion by el el uh, eliciting empathy and other feelings to make people aware of the violence committed by the military dictatorships against those who dared to think differently and fight for ideas that were considered subversive. The research is carried out in, uh, in Lofsky, uh, in the Gender and History Studies Laboratory as part of the Gender Feminism and Dictatorships in South Korea. And I put some people who work in this research now, but we are always having other students. It's a group research, it's not a solitary <laughs> research. Uh, this uh, project has already Oh, sorry. has already uh, led to publication of two books and production of two international colloquiums in 2009 and 2014. Uh, in this uh, research, pulling the resources of several projects, particularly funded by CNPK until now, we don't know what, is, what <laughs> will go uh, after Tamer, we carried out more than 200 interviews, as well as setting up a small library and an ar archive of digitized documents that include uh, publications from leftist and feminist organizations, pamphlets, diverse texts, reports, police and diplomatic documents, and others relating to different countries, uh, with more than 10,000 digital photos. Today, I will limit myself to talking about Brazil, while bearing in mind that the events to which I refer have a regional and global context. On the 1st April of new, uh, sorry, 1964, a military dictatorship began with the broad support and participation of sectors from civil society, conservative and liberal parties, the Catholic Church, the press, business people, and middle class, and bolstered by these sectors against communism with God and family and for freedom, like the women went to march uh, in Brazil to sustain, to support the of 1964, uh, they deposed uh, President João Goulart, who had been implementing a program called Base Reforms, which included agrarian reform, 
more rights for workers, investments in education and health, and the strengthening of state-run enterprises. The military remained in power for 21 years until 1985. Throughout this 21-year period, the resistance remained constant, although it never managed to really threaten the regime, which merely changed through a conservative and smooth transition when the corporate elite and international capital were certain that they would continue to lead the political process, even if it was democratic. What kind of resistance was that? I have uh, quite a broad perspective of resistance. Unlike some colleagues who uh, think that the, the, who only consider resistance to mean that which is organized around the possibility for regime change, deposing the government through, through political parties and armed movements, I consider resistance, I and my group and, <laughs> and a lot of other people, consider resistance to be any type of individual or collective action taken against the government, an institution, a law, or repressive action. Uh, thus, the armed struggle was resistance, the guerrilla was resistance, and there were women involved more than is normally imagined. And on the other hand, the groups of mothers and family members of imprisoned and the disappeared, they were with the the feminine movement for amnesty, uh, the nuns who hid people in their convents, the people who passed on messages, safeguarded documents, pretended not to notice meetings in their, build, in their buildings. They all, in their own, own way, participated in the resistance in a wider sense, but one that helped us to see the sparks to which Benjamin Referred. It is worth not, uh, noting that many of the women who participated in the leftist groups of the 60s, 60s and, and 70s became feminists from the second half of the 60s, 70s onward. Some of them took up to the streets also in 2015 in the feminist spring and are now involved in the 8th uh, March and the push for the decriminalization of abortion, which is being called for September 28th, next, this week. Uh, the Brazilian left has been accused, often fairly, of being centered on male figures, relegating women's issues and those of races, indigenous people, environment, etc., to a secondary plane, which providing, uh, while providing women with little space to act politically. There is even a new name to designate the idea of the classic leftist activist militant, the esquerdo macho, that's, that's <laughs> Uh, macho leftists, I don't know, it's a, a name feminists use today. Uh, nevertheless, it is important to remember that it was through the leftist organizations and parties that many women began to play a public role in Brazilian politics, especially in the new left, which emerged in the 60s and had two major recruitment Spaces in Brazil, the student movement and the Catholic Church and some Protestant pastoral movements linked to the liberation theology. That's not to say that there wasn't participation by people from other spaces like unions and, and even the army in the left. The participation of women as students in universities grew from, from 26% to 40% between 1956 and 1971, 
which also explains their greater role in the student move movement. This must be viewed within the context of the expansion of the universities that took place in this period, as well as the concurrent urbanization and expansion of the middle classes. The sons and daughters of urban workers and city service workers, and, and even from rural areas, began to gain access to university through the expansion of public education and the student movements were a vital source of activists for the leftist movements and political parties. For example, in 1968, Dulce Pandolfi, that's the first woman there, uh, a sociologist student in Recife, uh, North Brazil, was elected General Secretary of the Students' Union and joined the Ação Libertadora Nacional, that was um, an armed uh, organization, National Liberating Action. Maria Lígia Quartim de Moraes also studied social science, but in, in USP, in São Paulo. And she too was involved with the same organization, despite having contact with, also with the uh, popular revolutionary vanguard, in which her brother was one of the leaders. Vera Silvia Magalhães was also uh, this one in black and white, um, was also a student when she became involved in the Dissidência da Guanabara, a communist faction, and uh, having participated in the kidnapping of the United States ambassador Charles Elric in 1969. The late Catarina de Luca, that's here, from Santa Catarina, <laughs> was studying in Ufsk in 66, when she became part of the AP, Ação Popular, Popular Action. Helena Irata uh, was a student in Sao Paulo, too, and she began by participating in the students' movement, and then joining the Workers' Peasant Party, BOC. Some examples. With regard to the liberation theology, youth movements such as uh, uh, Catholic University uh, Youth, I don't know, Juki. <laughs> it, I don't know if there is something like this in, in United States, but in France, in, in, in various European uh, countries, there were this youth Catholics movement at that time, in the 50s, 60s, 70s. And um, by these youths, uh, Presbyterians and uh, Catholics, Presbyterians and Lutherans, were all very important at that point in time, and many of these young people ended up looking for alternatives for political action, whether in the AP, the Popular Action, that was one of the main leftist Brazilian organizations at that time, or through other means. Raquel Felau, that's this... Um, <laughs> She, uh, she says she was, she studied during her childhood in a nun's school and after entering university in the 60s in Paraná, she joined the, this uh, university youth, Catholic university youth, where she began to participate in the students' movement. And from there, she went straight to a, to a, a Sao Popular, a popular action. And she says, so when I joined the AP, we kept going with the same struggle as before in Juki. But now we had a more political outlook. In fact, I broke away from the church, and it happened like this. How can you preach one thing and do another? This was my issue with them. You preach loving your neighbor, but you don't put it into practice. This made breaking with the church easy for me because I had a concrete argument. From the AP, she and her companion, Gilles Bisoni, went to Parti, uh, 
Communist Party of Brazil, that's not the same as Communist Brazilian Communist Party, <laughs> and it, it was at that time uh, they proposed the armed struggle, uh, the guerrilla, and, and she had, uh, um, she still belonged to, to this party, having passed almost the entire dictatorship period in clandestinity. They also edited the party journal for a time in an underground printing office, and nowadays, uh, apart from her party activities, Raquel Felau is active in the uh, Brazilian Union of Women, UBM. Uh, through their interviews and memories, these women tell of the difficult, difficulties they experienced uh, within these parties and organizations. The main complaints are they were seen as those who should carry out the small tasks, such as bringing the coffee, paint banners and placards, type, and so on. But rarely were they called upon uh, or her during important decisions. Another complaint is uh, in organizations with clearly defined hierarchies, they, were, they very rarely rose to occupy positions of common or decision make, making. Uh, another is that in the houses of or aparelhos, the cells where they work, these kind of organizations, they were the ones normally responsible for survival, working outside the house, preparing food, and minding the children where there were any, thereby freeing up the men for the intellectual work which was more. Subjects related to women's liberation and feminism were almost always excluded for, from the day, texts, new bulletin, news bulletins or pamphlets, and viewed as device, uh, divisive or petty bourgeois issues. In summary, as Elena Irata says, and I think the leftist organizations in Brazil were actually very machistas, chauvinistas, sexists. Uh, but it's also important to consider that it was not common at that time for women to be part of political parties, even on the left. Marcelo Ridente researched the numbers and reports a female presence of less than 10% in parties such as Partido Comunista Brasileiro, Brazilian uh, Communist Party, or Socialist uh, Party, and fewer still in right-wing parties in Brazil at the 60s and 70s. In the new left, based on numbers of imprisoned people, women comprised 25% of some organizations. And if we remember that they were clandestine, time organizations, this number could have been higher. My argument here is that despite the machismo, the new left enabled women to gain access to political scene and offered a space for political intervention. And it is not no accident that Dilma Rousseff, along with many other female politicians from her generation, began their careers in one of these groups. In Brazil, there is a kind of founding myth for the second wave of feminism, as my colleague Joana Maria Pedro discusses, which occurred in 1975 with the creation by the UN of the um, Women's Internet, International Year, and which, with the gradual return to Brazil of the exiled uh, people and women coming to a head in 1979 with the Amnesty Law. That year, the 75 year, also marked the annihilation of the guerrilla movement in Brazil with the br brutal repression of Araguaia guerrilla. This is not to say that feminism began, began on this date in Brazil. 
Throughout the 20th century, various movements, ideas, and gatherings <coughs> may be seated in relation to feminism, including the movements for vote, the activity of groups of female anarchists, writers, and activists, such as Maria Lacerda de Moura, Berta Luz, even Jose Maria Murad, among others, which precede the 70s. The feminisms prior to that were labeled petit bourgeois, elitist, divisive, justifying a new feminism, which would be committed to the ideas of socialism and the new left, and sought to insert the women's struggle into the revolutionary <coughs> political struggle, or at least against the dictatorship. Here is a, there is a, a cartoon. It's about Rosemary Murad. She is a feminist, and she was considered to be, it's in, that's in 72, so before 75, and she is considered by being manipulated by North America feminists, like uh, Betty Friedman, who went there to, who went to Brazil at that time. And uh, in uh, who is the cartoonist, he was saw as seen as, some, uh, as someone from the left. He was not really <laughs> so <laughs> leftist, but... <laughs> uh, and this is Veja, that's uh, like times. Uh, it's very important uh, journal, magazine, in fact. Uh, so at that moment, uh, at of the, the left defeating Brazil, when the guerrilla was annihilated, when all people are, you are quiet, or you are off Brazil in exile, or you are you are very quiet. The women's movement seemed to be like a possibility for political organization in a very restrict, restrictive scenario. Several leftist parties invested in this idea, or at least their activists did so, such as Ildet Pereira de Mello, who was in the opposition party, NDB, and maintained relations with the Brazilian Communist Party. With a certain protection from repression, helped by the UN, many women who were active in informal groups, parties, and movements, such as the Movement for Amnesty or the uh, movement, the feminine movement for amnesty, organized themselves in the center, the da Mulher Brasileira, Brazilian Women's Center in Rio de Janeiro and in Center for Brazilian Women Development in São Paulo and through journals uh, Brazil Mulher, uh, Nós Mulheres, Mulheril in these years from 1975 until 80s, uh, early 80s. According to Amelinha Telles and Rosalina Cruz Leite, this moment enabled several women's associations, not necessarily feminists, to organize and express their demands, such as claims as by uh, housewives, female rural workers, movements for, for uh, children care, and against the cost of living, among others. It was also in this period that black women appeared as political subjects on the Brazilian scene also. This involvement of the parties gradually led to, to a certain institutionalization insofar as the opposition began to gain space with the creation of uh, women, womanhood councils and women's secret, secretaria, secret, secretariats, and uh, as well as police stations specialized in dealing with violent crimes against women, culminating 
in the PT of a government, I am making a very big <laughs> uh, bridge between the dictatorship and now, <laughs> uh, overseeing uh, the creation of the Secretariat for Women's Policies with ministry status. Many of these spaces were occupied by feminists, and this institutionalization was deemed by some to have been responsible for a, a degree of movement demobilization. Despite the significant awareness, it is impossible to deny the possibilities, laws, and funding made available through this institutionalization. The problem was imagining that the ministry, councils, or any other government agencies could substitute the feminist movements. This involves a wider debate that we do not have time right now, so we are continuing. <laughs> uh, in recent times, other types of movement that also make feminist claims have begun to appear in Brazil. Who are these contemporary feminists and how are they connected to previous movements? They, there is no ready-made or easy answer to this, but as the Think Olga blog describes, describing the feminist spring of 2015, feminism took the, to the streets, forcing its way into conversations and particularly into the lives of many women who had never imagined they would recognize them, themselves as such. The mass demonstrations and groups of women who invaded Brazil's streets are not restricted to a generation or speci speciality. From 2011 on, we had the Marcha das Vadias, slut walk, uh, featuring young women, often accompanied also by older women, but we ha also had the Marcha das Margaridas, Daisy March, by female rural workers from all over Brazil, and also the Black Women's March. In addition, there were protest marches against Eduardo Cunha and his retrogressive laws, and thousands of high school students occupied school in schools in São Paulo, Paraná e Rio Grande do Sul in 2015 and nationwide in 2016, including university campuses with much debate on gender and many young women participating and protagonizing these occupations. Women's groups began to appear in schools, unions, universities and neighborhoods, collectives, they, they call themselves collectives. Uh, collective. Anti princess workshops, children's books with female chart, uh, characters, documentaries, theater groups of the oppressed Madalenas, blogs, alternative press, feminist hip hop groups, uh, and even uh, dance groups, feminist batucada, group of uh, percussion, Afro hair workshops for women craft work have all played their part. In, in 2017, March uh, 8th, was marked by strike action and many demonstrations called the 8M, uniting women from all over uh, the world, I think. <laughs> Not, I don't know if all the world, but Americas, yes. Uh, Marcha das Vadias, that's Slut Walk, began in Brazil in 2011, following the example of the Slut Walk, a protest organized in Toronto, Canada, in response to the speech made by policeman Michael Sanguinetti in the University of York, in which he informed the audience that women should avoid dressing like sluts if they didn't want to be raped. In Brazil, this tied in with an episode that had great repercussion in the media, uh, where a, a female student was expelled from a college for dressing inappropriately, and especially in combating violence, femicide, 
and sexual violence, including, for example, violence on public transportation, such as trains and metros. This march has brought many young women to the streets, but it also attracted prostitutes, trans women, and as Morgan Guzzo shows in her research, they acquired very particular local significance. They took place in cities all over Brazil, both capitals and country towns, and where are very controversial. The march has its own aesthetics, which includes showing bare breasts and using the body as a canvas, while its organization is connected to social networks and seeks to be horizontal and disconnected from any formal leadership. The, another thing totally different is Marcha das Margaritas. Already, uh, that already took place in 2000, 2003, 2007, 2011, and 2015. In the most recent edition, more than 100,000 female rural workers went to Brasilia to put forward their demands to President Dilma Rousseff, that was yet in, uh, president, who received them. This march may only be understood in the light of the marches by female rural workers, beginning in the 80s, coming from church communities, uh, comunidades eclesiais, and the struggle of these women for recognition of their rights as workers. In the 90s, this movement began a gradual yet confrontational approximation with feminism, and many of these women now identify as feminists and are connected internationally through the World March of Women. Various rural workers organizations take part in the march organization, such as Contag, um, as, um, Sin Terra, uh, Without Land Movement, and uh, uh, Women's uh, uh, Peasants Women Movement. The, another one is Marcha das Mulheres Negras contra o Racismo e a Violência, Black Women's March Against Racism, Violence and for Good Living. was held in Brasilia on November 18, uh, 2015, and was called for by the art, uh, Black Brazilian Women's Articulation Coordination, bringing together around 50,000 black women. According to Luisa Barrios, former minister and recently deceased, uh, for the promotion, promotion of racial equality, you can no longer think of the country while disregarding the black population, which is in the majority, disregarding the black women, woman. If you do so, you are doing nothing and thinking nothing. And that is what the march is saying. The feminist spring was this uh, phenomenon. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was called feminist spring, this set of demonstrations that also gained wide media coverage, particularly since the movement, these movements had a great impact on social networks by calling on people through Facebook, WhatsApp, and other means. The demonstrations and campaigns won the mines and the streets in 2015 and produced continuity. These demonstrations were ma mainly in response to a conservative wave that is sizing control around the world and which in Brazil has as its mouthpiece the deputies and politicians connected to the evangelical churches and charismatic movements from the Catholic Church, as well as institutions such as the Freemasons. Approved and sanctioned by Dilma Rousseff in March of 2015, the femicide law that classifies the gender-motivated homicide of women as a heinous crime was the subject of heated debate in the Brazilian House of Representatives. And then uh, the Congress. And then the, con the Congress president Eduardo Cunha proposed a bill that would reformulate the laws on abortion, removing the right to abortion even in the case of rape. 
The ensuing debates involved an incident in which the deputy Bolsonaro, an uh, ex military evangelical and fascist deputy, informed a, a, a PT uh, Workers' Party deputy, Maria do Rosário, that he wouldn't rape her because she didn't deserve it, being so ugly. The Primavera Feminists comprised a series, or the Feminist Spring com, com, comprised a series of marches, including the major demonstrations against Cunha, this, and this other deputy, in Rio and São Paulo. Uh, the March, the Daisy's March, the Black Women March, and a series of virtual protests also in the social networks such as the campaign My Secret Friend and My First Harassment, where people uh, spoke about these uh, things in their lives. Besides an intense debate about the use of, text, of a text by Simone de Beauvoir with, with the famous phrase, you are not born a woman, you become one in the ENEM, a national high, the national high school exams. In 1960, a gang rape of a young woman in Rio de Janeiro, which was recorded and posted in Facebook by the rapists themselves, provoked responses on the internet and in the streets, with many demonstrations and a new wave of salute walks. All of this was accompanied by the school occupation movements, the leadership of young women, and the creation of feminist groups in many spaces. For example, in the University of Santa Catarina, for ex the, there are currently like 10 different feminist collectives, including one in the technology center, one in biology, one in journalism, and uh, others, and some part uh, linked to parties and other. But the, these groups are also present in high schools, unions, and other spaces. We get to the group. <laughs> the emergence of feminism as a mass movement with the marches and participation of social networks was unfortunately accompanied by an upsurge in a contrary movement, which could be classified as anti-feminist, anti-LGBT, anti-gender and misogynist. In Brazil, this movement is especially promoted by the Pentecostal Evangelical Church, it's not all, but of them, some of which have garnered major economic, political, and media inf influence in recent decades, with a selection of deputies and senators representing almost 30% of the National Congress, televisions and radios, and a network of pastors uh, and churches spread all around Brazil in all social classes. The Catholic Church also participates in this process, particularly with the charismatic renewal movements and groups such as Opus Dei, which are actively involved. The Freemasons, Rotary Club, and other non-governmental institutions have helped in this process. One of the issues that this movement pushed was the gender ideology and movimento uh, schools without political party, the school without uh, ideology. These movements adv advocate the removal of content on gender, feminist, and sexuality from the school, alleging that they are indoctrinating children to become homosexuals and destroying families. Besides, uh, besides this, they do not believe that teachers should express any political content in their classrooms. In other words, teachers of history, geography, and philosophy are heavily criticized and have been subjected to lawsuits, complaints, and a series of other actions. Several bills that are up for consideration in the National Congress have a strong chance of approval. The majority of them uh, prohibiting abortion in all cases, even if it's rape or even if it's uh, for malformation of the fetus and other 
cases, um, and they want about uh, the schools, and not, uh, there is another who allows um, who uh, weak, weaken it. The Maria da Penha law, that's a law that finally have uh, a violence against women uh, criminalized in Brazil. And 2016 also was also marked by march uh, in, in protests that used the colors of Brazilian flag in which demanded the impeachment of President Dilma Rousseff based on complaints of corruption that involved politicians from her party, especially after the start of, uh, of uh, an op operation by the federal policy, like FBI <laughs> here, there in Brazil. These demonstrations were called, in particular, particular by a group called Movimento Brasil Livre, Free Brazil movement, which is uh, strongly connected to all these things that I just described. I am referring to the impeachment as a coup because the constitu Constitution provides for impeachment only in the case where a crime has been committed. Until now, not one of the accusations leveled at Dilma Rousseff for corruption has been pro pro proven. The crime that justified the coup was the so-called pedalada fiscal that would be like cooking the books or consisted in a fiscal maneuver performed by all the previous governments involving the utilization of financial resources before the, their actual entry in the public coffers based on tax revenue projections. But I, what I would like to stress here is that misogyny and anti-feminism were instrumental in the coup. Dilma Rousseff was the first women, woman president of Brazil and she was re-elected for a second term despite the considerable, sorry, despite the considerable opposition of the elite class and the middle classes of the southern and southeastern states. Besides being a woman, Dilma, in her youth, was an activist connected to the armed organizations Colina and Varpalmares, and a political prisoner in 1970 when she suffered intense torture. She did not identify as a feminist, but in her government, the Secretariat for Women's Policies, which is with its status as ministry since Lula's government, was placed in the hands of Eleonora Menicucci, another former guerrilla and companion of Dilma in the Tiradentes prison, as well as a recognized feminist. The misogyny appeared unabashedly on the green and yellow banners of the protests on social networks, on the covers of influential, influential magazines, on television, and in advertising pieces. The low point of this took the form of a sticker, which could be attack, attached to the gas tank of your car, displaying the figure of the president with her legs spread open. On the days of the impeachment vote, deputies boldly held up disrespectful placards. The misogyny was not the cause of the coup, but it certainly contributed to the political climate that produced it. When voting, many deputies justified their votes in favor of the coup by saying that they were voting for their families, their wives and children, and their parents. That vote is worth a study that will certainly indicate the patriarchal, conservative, and oligarchical character of Brazilian politics. It was as if they were saying that they were there to represent their families and not the voters, who had, after all, re-elected Dilma. They were showing the deputies that a woman's place is in the private space, like their wives who, are, who were at home minding the kids and not in politics.
women are continuing the resistance. If other social sectors in Brazil seem to be anesthetized, not knowing what to do about it or what lies ahead, the women's movement is taking a totally different approach. For the 8th of March 2017, there was a proposal for a women's strike throughout Brazil and in several other countries called 8N, which not be, uh, while not being a strike as such in, uh, in some parts, uh, the demonstrations still brought women onto the streets all over the country. In Florianópolis, I witnessed the organization of the 8M and I was surprised to find sectors of movements and parties together that would never otherwise sit down at the same meeting. There were young people from the Marcha das Vadias, the high school occupiers, the different women's groups, the unions, uh, uh, Unit Central of Workers, CUT, uh, parties like PSTU TU, and PT and Parti Com uh, Communist Party, a lot of parties that don't work together, but they were there in the same uh, place to discuss and to organize this protest. Along with the campaign uh, no one, not one less, eh? nenhuma menos, against violence and femicide. The Fora Temer, Temer out, Temer get out, <laughs> no. uh, movement echoed through the demonstrations with percussion, music, and dancing, and the colors of the Marcha Mundial das Mulheres, Wolves, Women's March, and Black Women's Groups. And now they are organizing for the uh, 28th of September. Let's talk about abortion. That's the as, as in the times of resistance to dictatorships, when women often put themselves on the forefront to denounce the violence, torture, and disappearances to demand democracy in la casa in la calle, eh? Democra democracy in the home and in the street, women are again the protagonists of some resistance. From the I would like to finish with some with the Congress we just organized in Brazil from the 30th of July to the 4th of August in 2017. We held the, the, the 13th Women's World Congress and Fazendo Gênero. And I'm not going to talk about the academic part of this Congress, which included the presentation of approximately 3,000 scientific papers. I want uh, to talk about the political significance of receiving 9,351 uh, registrations. <laughs> the women's social movements, particularly those involved in the organization of the 8M, went to the Congress, not only for the event, but also to construct an unprecedented intersection between academia and activism. On every day of, of the event, on the every day of the event, there was a big tent on campus with workshop, artistic performances, conversation groups, craft work and women's co-op products for sale. Indigenous women, black women from Brazil and other countries, notably Mozambique, union members, farmers, high school students, undergraduates and artists circulated through the tent and the conference rooms, round tables and other activities. And on Wednesday, we had the Marcha Mundos de Mulheres por Direitos, Women's World March for Rights, with the participation of approximately 8,000 people. This march sums up the spark of hope I want to leave with you today. And I wanted to, to invite you to see it's for me a video of four minutes. And 